because I do hear Coach in my head right now saying, please don't make this the Pentecostal or Baptist length eulogy. I would prefer that you deliver the succinct, profound, Catholic version of the homily. So if there's a title to what I want to say about Coach Wooten, the headline for this message would be the life of Morgan Wooten demands a supernatural explanation. By the way, I believe that Father Damien got a hold of my notes because he wanted to keep me to 10 minutes or less. And he um, took the notes from my wife and I noticed I'm missing a few pages, so bear with me as I and live through some of this. When you think about all of the accomplishments of Morgan Wooten, and just a snippet, and some that Father Damien has already delineated, it is truly mind-blowing what Coach has done in the natural realm. Father Damien has already, again, delineated a few of those, but as I look at some of the banners hanging here, they also go on to speak about all that Morgan did for 31 consecutive years. Every senior on his basketball team got a college scholarship. It's the only high school in the country that has ever sent two players, Adrian Danley and Kenny Carr, from the same high school team to play on the U.S. Olympic team. Of course, we all know about his outstanding victory over the team's outstanding victory over Power Memorial back in 1965, snapping the 71-game win streak of then-named Luau Sender, of course, known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. As a matter of fact, I remember going to do an interview with Kareem when I was working with CBS the first time. And I didn't play on that team. I was in the eighth grade listening to it on the radio. And when I came to sit down to talk with Kareem, he kind of gave me a little bit of a funny look. And he said, um, you, 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 went to, you went to that school, right? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't lie because you know, I'm, a, I'm a believer. So I said yes, thinking that he was going to walk away but he had nothing but superlative to say about Morgan Wooten. Coach, as we all know, was the first person who coached exclusively at the high school level to be inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, but also the Naismith Basketball Foundation in Atlanta recognized Coach as the greatest boys high school coach of the century. And all of this from a man who started his coaching career at a boys orphanage over in Northeast DC, coaching basketball without having a basketball court or without having basketball goals with which to practice with. It's unbelievable. But in the years that I played for coach, and I did vouch for this with some of the guys who span the ages of those who played for coach, Johnny Jones, um, Kenny Roy, Danny Ferry, and a few others when I was here, I can never remember one time when coach focused solely, emphasized, obsessed about winning a basketball game. He stressed maximizing the gifts and talents with which the Lord blessed us to become the best player, to become the best teammate, to become the best person that we could. That's the way coach went about it, knowing that if we did the right things the right way, we would be successful. So let me zero in on a few minutes here on just how Coach used the basketball floor as he often referenced it as an extension of his classroom to teach us life lessons through basketball. It started, number one, with him emphasizing the fundamentals, mastering the fundamentals. He said if we internalize those, if we sharpen those, those things would ensure success, not only in basketball, but in the game of life. So many players being influenced by what they see on TV want to master doing the extraordinary things on the court, to elicit the oohs and ahs from fans or other players, thinking that was important. But Morgan taught that fundamentals are timeless. They're tried, they're true, and they are proven. So Morgan says, don't do that because if you want to enjoy sustained success, what's important is to do the ordinary things extraordinarily well. That is that which will be built upon with that which is known as success. And you know what? There was a time that I did forget what Morgan taught about stressing the fundamentals. This is when I had moved into the world of broadcasting in my first year working with CBS, and management wanted me to uh, consider that a career, but said that you need to learn how to broadcast some of the sports that you haven't played. Now, despite the size and girth that you see on me right now, 
uh, as opposed to Adrian and the others still having their high school bodies. I didn't play football, so I had to learn football. And when I did my first game, and some of you have heard the story, they said, JB, just focus on the basics. Don't try to get fancy. Just go through a clean first half, and it'll be easy. So I go through the first half of the football game. It's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers hosting the Atlanta Falcons. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Football is not that difficult. Complacency, which will start the precipitous slide downward if you allow that to creep in. So we get to the second half, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm good with football. I can handle this. And I mentioned that Steve DeBerg was a quarterback. He takes a snap, delayed handoff to James Wilder, the running back. Wilder, he goes through the 40. He's at the 45. He's got daylight. He's at the 50. He's at the 55. He's tackled at the 60-yard line. <laughs> my producer got in my ear and said, JP, go to commercial. There's no such thing as a 60-yard line. <laughs> now I'm shook up because they had told me to look at the TV monitor, which would have the right time, but I made the mistake. I looked up at the stadium clock, which was wrong. I said, we're going to step aside for a quick timeout with about eight minutes and 99 seconds left in the third period of play. <laughs> Thank God my teammate, who was a player at Harvard as well, he came back and said, for those of you who heard JB say eight minutes and 99 seconds, he just wanted to see if you were thinking it could make the conversion to know there were nine minutes and 39 seconds left. But that was the one time that I did forget. Number two, Morgan talked about basketball being a team game. And it's the same in the game of life. No one player, no matter how gifted, and Morgan has coached some gifted ones. You heard me call a few names out already. Some gifted players. But it was not about that one player, that everybody had a gift to contribute to the success of the team. Somebody might be a great defensive player who kept the opponent under his average so to, as to enhance the chances of, of us winning. Somebody was a pretty tough-nosed player who would dive on the floor for the loose ball, keeping possession for us so that we will maintain the momentum. Those things don't show up in the stat column, but Morgan made certain to complement and recognize the contribution of those. And the point of that second point was that he says in the game of basketball, it takes 10 hands to score one basket. Point made. Number three of the four points that I want to make. He strengthened our conviction that to know that if we master the fundamentals, if we recognize that it was a team game and everybody had to carry their weight, that no matter the circumstances, if you prepared properly the right way and had the belief and conviction that you're standing on the proper process that you implemented to prepare for that game, more often than not, you and we would be an overcomer. And that certainly applies in the game of life. Now, Morgan isn't here, but I hear, well, he's here in spirit, but I hear Morgan in my head because the one basketball example that I learned about how true that lesson was, was when Joe, I believe it, we played um, Long Island Lutheran High School. They had a great team, some tremendous All-Americans on their squad, but we prepared thoroughly for that game. And when we got in the game, we played well. It was nip and tuck the entire game until we got down to the final 30 seconds of the game. We were trailing by six points. Morgan calls timeout. We come over to the bench forlorn, weary, because we had given it everything that we could. There were no three-point uh, three uh, line there, and there were no shot clocks. So they had the ball. 30 seconds left. They were up by six. We sit down on the bench. Morgan inexplicably comes over with this excited look in his eyes. He's got a smile. He said, fellas, we got them right where we want them. <laughs> And then Morgan proceeded to say, they are complacent right now. They're a little lax. They think they've got it done. Remember that full court press that we worked on and you guys believe in it? It will get the job done. Here's what's going to happen. And he walked us through the steps and we won that game. But it also lets us know that as long as there is time left on the clock, whether in a game of basketball or in a game of life, if we're standing on truth, God's word, you will be successful more often than not because God knows what he's talking about. His classroom was the basketball court. And the fourth point is Morgan was clearly an extraordinary leader who understood that leadership is a sacred trust because he had the power and influence to change our lives, to make a difference. And all these years later, at age 68 years of age, Morgan made a difference and he changed a lot of lives. But it's because coach, coach possessed some characteristics. 
I know they're considered trite, well-worn. People always have itching ears wanting to hear something new. And it goes back to the point Coach made. There's no such, hey, the Bible says it. I believe it's in, in the book of Ecclesiastes or Isaiah said, there's nothing new under the sun. Morgan stressed that we had to be people and men of character and integrity, and he was. Knowledge, wisdom is even better. Wisdom is the right application of God's word. Fairness, integrity, good judgment, consistency, discipline, all of those things Morgan possessed in abundance. And it's already been said, I love the fact that Coach was a humble man. I believe Johnny Jones said that. Coach, talk about displaying humility. I've never heard him brag one time. As a matter of fact, my good friend, Coach Tony Dungy, it was his mother, a Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Cleo Dungy, who made the expression that excellence that feels the need to be proclaimed by the mere fact of its proclamation amidst the doubt of its existence. Morgan let everybody else talk about him, believing in the scripture that I believe is in Matthew 23 and 7, which says that he who exalts himself, God will abase. But he who is humble, God will exalt. And everybody knew that that applied to a T for Morgan Wooden. But he learned from his good friend John Wooden of UCLA fame that while he possessed those characteristics and he was a good leader, that as a young guy, if he wanted to become a great leader, there was one other quality that he must internalize. And the best way that I can say that is to talk about Morgan's classroom. John Wooden, of course, of UCLA fame, 10 national um, NCAA basketball titles, elegant man, a man who stood on the word of God as well. Morgan's classroom was the basketball court, one in which I have never ever seen nor heard of coach yelling at a player, berating a player, never uttering a profanity. Morgan was human, but I never heard Morgan utter a profanity because he said to yell and scream and engage in what you see a lot of coaches these days thinking that leadership is engaging in a profanity-laced tirade to so-called inspire and motivate a player, please. Morgan said that created a toxic environment, an atmosphere that is not conducive to learning. Morgan learned from Coach Wooden that the most powerful and effective four-letter word that you can use and model is love, antithetical to what many who look to become a good coach today. But that's what Morgan did. And when I think about love, Again, I think about that which is stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Those first 10 verses are called the, the love letter, if you will, the love portion of the Bible. It says that love never fails. So I came to realize later in life that all which Coach Morgan Wooten did was quite simply rooted in the four priorities that Father Damien talked about. And I'll just do it in reverse order. That as basketball, or as one of his grandkids said, athletics, that was fourth. That was fourth. Number three was school. Clearly a foundation of my parents, my father and mother, God bless them. My father worked as a prison guard at Lorton, drove a taxi cab, worked at Ava's rent -a car in the holiday season to provide for the four kids because my mother wanted to be the excellent homemaker that she was to be blessed with an opportunity to come to a school like DeMatha, where $500 a year for tuition was beyond reach for us. But praise God, they worked to send the kids there. And basketball was fourth, as I mentioned, school was third, family was second. Morgan epitomized that with his wife, Kathy. I got to know Kathy just a little bit. Kathy rules the roost. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. Ephesians 5.25 says, husbands, love your wives. Morgan carried it one step further. Listen to your wives. <laughs> Kathy, I can report to you after all of this time, I'm a well-trained husband by my wife now. 
But I asked Morgan several years ago when I was blessed over at the old gym, Tom Ponton, to do a 60 Minutes sports profile on Morgan Wooten. The greatest coach I've ever known, Dean Smith, Red Auerbach, John Wooden, all said he was the finest coach they'd ever met. And I asked him this question as if I didn't know the answer. Coach, why in the context of basketball do you have God being number one? He said, if I got a player playing for me, who understands that God is number one in his life because the word the Bible does say, bring all of your cares to him, place them at his feet. He's a loving God who wants to provide. Then I know I have a winner playing for me. By the way, I, I'm, I'm just visualizing Father Damien over in the rectory tapping his feet to the Southern Baptist gospel songs. <laughs> A lot of changes at DeMatha since I've been here. <laughs> I close by saying this. Morgan said that he wanted to be remembered as a good husband first. And when two people get married, according to the Bible, I don't care what the mores and trends of society are today. The word is true. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And when one gets married, they become one, which is why it is named the Morgan and Kathy Wooten Gymnasium. They shared in all of this together. He said that he wanted to be remembered as a good teacher and a good father. His family can certainly attest to that. Make no mistake about it. So I close by reminding everyone that in the Hall of Fame induction speech that Morgan gave in 2000, lay the answer to why Morgan's life demands a supernatural explanation. As Father Damon said, because God was number one in everything that Morgan did. He didn't go around beating us over the head with the Bible. It may have taken some time to figure it out, but Morgan was in the word every day, and I would encourage all of us to do that. In that Hall of Fame induction speech that Tom Pond sent, sent to me, I was reminded as I was blessed to represent Morgan's players, Red Auerbach presented him into the hall. Morgan said that it was his hope that we would all aim to have our names inscribed in the most important hall of all. Darren Haynes mentioned this on his sportscast the other night. And that is in the hall of heaven, more accurately in the Lamb's Book of Life. So as Morgan did, I would implore you, knowing that that's the most important ingredient to be successful in the game of life because eternity is a lot longer than that which we deal with here in secular society on the earth. And for all of the accolades that Morgan was blessed to have, God was number one. And when we talk about remembering Morgan, it's also stated in the Bible in Proverbs chapter 10, verse seven, that the memory of the just is blessed. Morgan's memory is blessed. And because Morgan coached from the best playbook there is, which is the Bible, because the Bible is inerrant. God says it himself in Numbers 23 and 9. If we claim that the Bible is the book upon which we stand and live our lives, then it needs to be based on the character and integrity of God. And God says in number 23 and 19, I am not a man that I can lie nor the son of man that I should repent. And the reason that Morgan's spirit and soul are in the presence of the Lord right now, because in Micah chapter five, verse two, it says, in hope of eternal life, God who cannot lie. And because Morgan coached from the playbook of God, he was blessed to be able to touch and impact people across society, from orphans to champions. Praise God. Thank you, JB. Please be seated. One of the traditions at DeMatha that more